Welcome, all of you, to the second hallway reading of the spring series. I'm Hilary Gravendike. I'm the co-curator with faculty curator Charles Altieri back there. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> and um, we're just thrilled to have Cole Swenson with us tonight. I'm so glad she could make it. And also very lucky to have graduate poet Rachel Beck with us also. Um, before we start, I just want to take a minute to remind you of upcoming events. On March 15th, we're going to have Joshua Clover read with Colin Dingler from the Rhetoric Department. And on April 17th, Jory Graham will be reading with uh, Jennifer Reimer from the Ethnic Studies Department. So come for both of those events. Um, if you missed Aaron Kunin's reading with Jill Richards on the 7th of February, you can check it out online at holloway.english.berkeley.edu. You can watch it, download it to your iPod, what you will. Um, <clears throat> and you can also get information about tonight's reading, download tonight's reading in about a week, and all the upcoming information about the upcoming readings. You can download flyers, so please go to the website and check it out. Um, after tonight's reading, there'll be a brief Q&A with Cole Swenson, if she'll be so kind. And then we will do our drawing for a free book, and hopefully um, Cole will sign that for the winner. Would that be okay? Great. She said yes. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, I'm going to welcome Trudy Obi to the podium, who's going to introduce our graduate poet, Rachel Beck. Welcome, Trudy. I'm very honored to be introducing Rachel Beck. She's a current grad student in the English department here at Berkeley. She got her bachelor's degree at Lawrence University in Wisconsin and her master of fine arts at the University of Iowa. In addition, she was a recipient of the Paul Engel Fellowship from the James Missioner Foundation. Rachel's poems have been published in several journals, including Calix, Volt, Lilliput, an online journal, Emic, Wallace Stevens Journal, and the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Her poems were also published in an anthology entitled In a Fine Frenzy, Poets Respond to Shakespeare. Her manuscript, For Want, was a finalist for the Core First Book Prize and the National Poetry Series. The poets she most admires are Frank O'Hara, Gertrude Stein, and Robert Duncan. Among other influences, she lists Gerard Manley Hopkins, John Donne, Marianne Moore, liturgy, nursery rhymes, early 20th century collage poems, M.F.K. Fisher's food writing, J.S. Bach cantatas, conduct books, fresh seasonal produce, and the Oxford English Dictionary. That said, it is no surprise that Rachel's poetry is filled to bursting with words, with voices, with sensations, with illusions and allusions, and of details. There's an interesting paradox in Rachel's work. On the one hand, her poems are very much grounded in the day-to-day -day mundane domestic world. Subjects include grocery shopping, dinner parties, household chores, on the other hand, her language and imagery is infused with the sublime, the sacred, the sacramental, Isiris measuring hearts with a caliper. Rather than playing these two realms against each other, she subsumes each one into the other, so that the poetry, containing both as they contain each other, is stretched even further to create more space. The readers left to ponder questions like, just how clean laundry must be to enter heaven, and whether Puritan poetry or pottery could survive the fall, one recalls scholastic exercises. Rachel bedevils our senses, almost as if she's composing in several media at once. One minute, we're squinting at the afterlife through blurry glasses. The next, we're savoring the taste of peaches floating gingering in red wine. Although her poetry is very rich in this way, the language is never ostentatious. Rather, its quiet strangeness draws us in, leading us into places where we may not belong. Maybe we have passed by before. In fact, we have. But this time, we are looking through the borrowed eyes of God. Please welcome Rachel Beck.
one of the best things about being the person reading is that I get to drink the water. <laughs> I would like to begin tonight with a Frank O'Hara poem um, from Lunch Poems um, called Cambridge. It is still raining, and the yellow-green cotton fruit looks silly round a window giving out on winter trees with only three drab leaves left. The hot plate works. It is the sole heat on earth and instant coffee. I put on my warm corduroy pants, a heavy maroon sweater, and wrap myself in my old maroon bathrobe. Just like Pasternak in Marburg. They say Italy and France are colder, but I'm sure that Germany's at least as cold as this. And, lacking the master's inspiration, I may freeze to death before I can get out into the white rain. I could have left the window closed last night, but that's where health comes from. His breath from the Urals, drawing me into flame like a forgotten cigarette. Burn. This is not negligible, being poetic and not feeble, since it's sponsored by the greatest living Russian poet at incalculable cost. Across the street, there is a house under construction, abandoned to the rain. Secretly, I will go to work on it. I promised a couple of people that I would read my Gertrude Stein poem tonight. Um, <clears throat> there are um, two items of background that you should know. Um, first is that um, Madam Conventional Wisdom um, comes from a book of etiquette and fashion tips um, written by Emily Cho. Um, and the second is that um, this stems from me re-envisioning Gertrude Stein as the first riot girl. Some concessions must be made. Madam Conventional Wisdom says, a sense of occasion, better to overdress than to under, keep some secrets, better to be unsure. Not from lack of occasion, but Gertrude a riot with grr aplenty. The eggs are coming, the British are coming, but glee lifts all things high and hefty. Ladies in comfy shoes at tea, whee! Look out, hysteric, your womb's on the loose. The sexual politicos marchant on navy, they smell of burnt sausages covered in gravy. Madam C.W. again. When you pull a pen from your purse, it becomes an accessory. It should be carefully chosen. Keep your head high on the rotisserie. Eeny, money, I made a malay out of leftover chocolate from Valentine's Day. Ma maven mauve, please note the cares I am full of. Le guerre, the thinning soup, wolf at the door. Sometimes the wiry hairs above my lip. More often, how to fuck shit up. As for pens, I won't use one that's scratchy. Diana Vreeland's far too matchy-matchy. <coughs> the next poem, Where Simple Lines, also has an epigraph from Emily Cho. If you are petite, you don't have enough display area for anything complicated. <coughs> It's true. <laughs> I'm full with crinoline and a desire to try on hats, blades down, bluster width, open to debate. She's highly constructed of scratchy excuse. Who'll give a feather? Summer bespeaks limed linen and clocks, which startle. Felt still a statement at this time of year, as is tufted chenille. Clothes wear off on the wearer. Jersey that stained, collarbone indigo will never come back. Except ribbed knits sounds nothing like voile and tulle. Crushed net underskirts, nettle legs bedraggle me. Jet blue shifts, she won't wear a clip on her sheath gown on the town if you, pre if you name it velour, precedent a service. 
Laws govern the use, both of warfare and car fare. Light from my sig may be seen. Green flick says I've got a great brain. These are just lungs, girl. Papery jewels putting on the fritz. I believe in taffeta static, velvet columnar. Make me an accessory, tortoise shell, sharp appended, the side of the head will not be loosed, not an earring dropped too soon. Hair in beads in rage, a state in shambles. De Sabier for a less political context. In the fine rub to the suede of things, sweetly. The fisherman's sweater, swelling of <coughs> land buoys and bare legs. Nothing in the trunk that's a fixative liquor. Isabel is a name, the color of stained linen, petticoats in siege, O oh, yellow and love ridden and long. Thank you for indulging me. Those two poems fell out of my manuscript, and um, they get lonely and they want to be trotted out in public. Um, and everything else is from my manuscript. Put your task in vertical stripes, and it will appear to be a manageable size. <coughs> when I heard the clicking postal meter, I knew I was being sent somewhere. I spent an hour in the reason place, between an ear and another ear, the better to hear confession, mostly mine, though I stopped at the sign of the sun overhead, though I waited an answer, stayed, the ache between blades of my birthday built of code and redbird bones. Anyway, something scarlet on the woodpile sings the one song I've learned to identify. Do you ever think of moving on? Should I follow it over to its shining, home to whatever it is, watch the branches scrape the grid of the blinds? Every day the sun comes up with something new to draw. How line meets line, runs circles around it, meets coil and vine in the clasp of my hand. What if I, set wandering palms to the cool pane, became the glass seen through and medium? When you took off a stay a while, let out your lungs in the forest, the green brighted your arms brimming with fern, veiny in light, out the seeds and sweet juices, your lips in red at the ready, you said me so I came out right, <coughs> a spell, a spelling, a sunburned bird, beware flying squirrel, Beware all small and curious things. It isn't that I'd mean to do you harm. The, grass is, the glass is cracked, but not all the way through. Somewhere is a winter bird squeaking like teeth on ice. Somewhere is a candle sending soot and sediment drifting into extremities. To you, I lose entirely. It's you I lose entirely, whom exactness can't buy back. I want to be whole, to hold, to be on hold, to be held unhallowed, to hold my fire, though it burn me. Is that too much to ask? The next title is taken from a book of Simone Weil called Gravity and Grace. It's obedience. There are two kinds. Um, and this is a num one of a number of poems that um, I have written for dogs. Oh, wag, Sirius says, and good morning's the book out of my hands. We are out for a walk, bristleback lively, even before I have washed my eyes. Everything I see through a forecast of clouds lent by a walk in the park. He stops to be territorial and shoots himself on the foot. South toward the dam. From this distance, the water looks immobile, the color of cars. Close attention is not enough, Claudia says, so late in our history. Be absolutely quiet in hopes of lengthening. Even at the hour when the joggers are thickest, we are separated by the shapes of our leads. I love, my love, through a pane of glass. Your eyes have changed color. 
the streaks and shine are the death of us. Some fears are untouched by exaggeration. <coughs> Let's cross the street, monstrosity. Stranger than fiction is coming for us. From this distance, his mouth in floral profusion, red, teetery in the region not for gossip. Under our feet is zoned warmer. Legion of Angels, Poster Children. I hope not all ardor is theatrical, least of all mine for the sandwich shop, cashew butter dotted with raisins. I have said I need, I need, when I do not need. In the steeple, someone is ringing the changes, bells unweighted by a sense of return. Whoever used the eyes of God going home from you gave them for ornaments. Let me have it then, in mud, the smell of wet oak leaves overrides the smell of dry oak leaves. And this poem is about shopping at Target, which is a really, truly unparalleled joy. <laughs> Two bowls. I wanted a bowl. I wanted a bowl for peaches. I wanted a bowl for peaches floating gingered in red wine. I wanted a bowl of which peaches, gingered and drunk on wine, would not be ashamed. I ignored frosted plastic, grim striped stoneware. I passed bowls barely larger than a baby's fist. In the fourth aisle, I caught my breath at cobalt. It sang under my hand, a voice fine and spare. I envisioned dinners in a city, my table clothed in wit and fresh vegetables, friends who would teach me to eat artichokes the right way. In the center, this blue jewel, <coughs> peaches, an attendant ladle. I envisioned that if asked where I found this bowl, I'd lie. It came from an art auction, a trip to Italy. I have no idea it was a present. But such thin porcelain, Surely it could break in a hiccup of sun, shards of deep sky. What then? Only memory, a poor vessel. I chose instead the next bowl, the color of oyster sand, ringed wedgwood blue, heavy as my femur, simple, rather Puritan. It did not smell of fragile breath. It could survive a hard fall. And because Demeter um, from my cohort started out um, last semester's series with a grandmother poem, um, I wanted to conclude my reading tonight with my grandmother poem. Um, it is not often that an assignment to write an elegy um, bumps up with an occasion to write an elegy uh, for someone you feel like elegizing, but um, it happened. Exhortum est for Marian. Um, and those of you who are bored, um, there are a lot of um, quotations in here from other poems, and so you can um, play spot the quotation and see how many you can find. <laughs> April is not about to give you back, but look, the Belarusian snowfields air their frosty laundry, stocking caps a flap as mountain fresh and close as possible. Blue blink. Your eye in two? We'll see. The shoreline pitches pin lights under us. In the event of loss, breathe naturally into the bag thy easy numbers. You are what I've run to see. Osiris holds your heart in calipers and prods it. How much will it give? It bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. It smells like mackerel. Oh, jackal god, are you finished with us yet? A cursor is blinking on the monitor, the backspace key pressed down, blue flash. I curse. What's been erased? The spinach soup with scallion, the names of all the lilies in the yard, some organ preludes, most of Hopkins, how to love someone you can't always stand. I'm not like you. I need it written down. <coughs> nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor aught and all. I don't recall the rest. 
When I got dressed today, I felt my way to your room, slipped your glasses on in place of mine, as close as possible. Of course, the room welled, watery. I couldn't see it was a silly thing to do. I kept them on and listened to the radio, Den alles Fleisch, es ist wie Gras, as all the lights were treading water overhead. Who could foresee the blindness too much light breeds in an open eye, despite my face? These days, philosophy and 50 cents will buy a cup of pico. Okay, it's more like 80 times a flinty bargain. Once, I tried to hide your spilled kalesh behind a picture frame, <coughs> then wiped it with my sleeve. The puddle's not the giveaway, you said. We know some things we cannot see. To draw ourselves up taut. You lean to ring, to wrench my zither into pitch, an interval I hear so lemony and long, it wakes me from my sleep. A bird without a branch, ungauzed. I will not leave you comfortless, it sings, but in a catch to keep exact. The lark at break of day sings best, as if a break begets a blessing. No, good grief. What's good about it? The who's in Cincinnati and has incited the world. It presses in as close as possible and says, I've got you covered, takes me by the elbow. Should I be alarmed? Your heart is measured in its hand. The tissue is the giveaway. I cannot see what holds me here, but feel the wind of its soft fall. Now thank we all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Fisher. I'm um, going to introduce Cole Swenson. Cole Swenson is a remarkably prolific writer. Her 11th book of poetry, The Glass Age, is just out hot on the heels of The Book of a Hundred Hands, published in 2005, and Go Est, which was a finalist for the 2004 National Book Award. Earlier volumes won the Iowa Poetry Prize, the New American Series, I'm sorry, the New American Poetry Series Award, and the National Poetry Series Competition. Swenson is the recipient of two Pushcart Prizes, a Pen American Award for Translation, and most recently, a Guggenheim Fellowship. She is also an important translator of contemporary French poetry, having brought the work of such writers as Olivier Cadieu, Pierre Alferi, Jean Frémont, Pascal Monnier, and Suzanne Doppelt into English. And some of you may have heard her um, speak last fall on a, there was a conference on the everyday in poetry. Um, anyway. Swenson is a master of the book length sequence. In her hands, themes or things like whiteness or the incandescent or glass or the hand itself become objects of an investigation that, it, that is at once historical and aesthetic. Part of the pleasure of reading Swenson comes from being in the presence of this quick and curious mind as it turns its subject around, moving between varied discourses and modes in a manner one might describe as seamless, except that the other great pleasure of reading Swenson comes from seeing the hinges of her thought, the moments of movement between discourses and modes. Here's one example from The Glass Age. Glass is not a liquid, but a non-crystalline rigid, and the window is made, I'm sorry, and the window made its first appearance in Rome around the year 100 when reviewers said, of poor optical quality, yet those who wanted fissured sight were living twice and lifted. When I was a child, I had a glass kite, said the child staring out the window of the speeding train. This poem reveals the subtle associative and metonymic shifts that characterize Swenson's poetic mode. We are born across a series of registers, physical and metaphysical, historical and surreal, yet with a graceful speed that makes these shifts feel essentially apt. This poetics of motion finds its perfect subject of inquiry in the window, which, she writes, is infinite, its perimeter increasing forever without sur ever surpassing its frame, has everything to do with sight as exceeding. The glass age is interested both in the frame and in what exceeds it, in the transparency of glass, which she calls 
the nothing you can see through and its compositional qualities. Indeed, she suggests that glass has a similar materiality to language in the way it structures our perceptions. Swenson examines how the fragile materiality of glass has composed our relationship to space, landscape, the body, the work of art. The glass age at once creates a compelling history of visual technologies and retells the story of modernity through the lens of glass. From book to book, Swenson meditates on how invention and art at once inhabit and shape our sense of scale, velocity, flight. In Go Est, for example, she writes of the invention of the pencil. The mark upon parchment increases the window, or may even be the window behind which a swaying branch appears human. Or, in the Book of a Hundred Hands, she shows how hands artfully deployed as shadow puppets take on the lightness and delicacy of birds. The hand writes in the air, the bird stays there. Her work insists on the fundamental errancy and elusiveness of materiality. Swenson discovers mystery in seeming facticities, the pulse of heartbeats, the first light bulb, a square of glass. She writes, a window is always relative to a body, and the body is never repeated, thus proliferates. Because every body involves a window or windows looking out on the world at large, as they say, the body is not single. And though painting was invented to correct this, it has ended up accomplishing the opposite, making the eye an errant thing, like that mode of traveling based on forgetting, which we also call the body, so that these windows bring us back but not to us. In revealing the eye to be one among the many windows through which we see, Swenson shows the frames through, through which we approach the material world. This vision is not an impoverished one, though, for in her work, estrangement paradoxically equals embodiment. Like the child carried along on the speeding train, Swenson's reader sees a familiar territory made strange and newly alive. Her work brings us back, but not to us. Please join me in welcoming Cole Swenson. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It's having an introduction done by someone who's a literary critic always adds a lot of depth to it. I think, yeah, right, that's what I'm doing, sure. It's like really nice. I'm going to read from a variety of things. I just sort of felt like um, changing speeds from time to time tonight. Can everyone hear me? Okay, okay. I'm going to start with a couple sections from the Glass Age. Most of the book is about Pierre Bonnard, the uh, post-impressionist painter, and in particular, his paintings of windows. And so it's, it's also about the development of glass in the 19th century, but in particular, this idea of the, the window as... Uh, a physical opaque thing. Uh, so having said that, I'm going to start with the section that's about another painter, a Danish painter named Wilhelm Hammershoi. Wilhelm Hammershoi, 1864 to 1916, obsessively painted windows looking out on windows and painted through repeating glass doors that opened into rooms with nothing in them. Pale green on pale gray, the doors are often they look into other rooms also open. He also painted windows. I'm sorry. He also painted women, often from the back, and often leaning over something in their laps, but he tended not to mix them with the windows. I see no difference, he said. I have a nervous habit of tracing a heart in his palm with his thumb. Hammers Hoy made a room a ship on its own, with panes overlapping all over the floor. The windows are drawn, the windows come in, the windows come running, and the open door is falling into room after room with the silence of sun. He said, open, and everything he painted then opened, a woman sewing, enters in infinite gradations. The white that never gets there remains, who, alone in a house with light, built his house entirely of doors. I just remembered I should check the time. Okay. 
And I'm going to skip and read the last section because I know there are a lot of poets in the room. And the last section looks at various French poets who all had poems titled Les Fenêtres or La Fenêtre, the, the window or the windows. <coughs> Bonnard's antecedents included Mallarmé's Les Fenêtres, with its galleys of gold, beautiful as swans, in which the arc into which we walk, geometry with imprecision at its heart, as the circle always veers in its infinity, necessity. A man stands in his room and looks straight through, who'd gotten old as he turned to see and saw the sun hitting stone and heard a man calling glazier, glazier, down in the street below. Baudelaire also wrote a poem titled Les Fenêtres, in which derrière une vitre vit la vie, in which another's life takes over and light must pass through as though expected. A window always marks the meeting of edges. You might stumble. For Mallarmé, a window looked outward, whereas Baudelaire's looked back, somehow a part of the glance they mean. Whereas Bonnard managed, through adamant insistence, through window after window, through sheer repetition, to keep them from doing any such thing. A life-size window is the size of a life. There is nothing more, said Baudelaire, and here inserted numerous adjectives, than a window lighted by a single candle. The flame at that distance resembles a face which glances out, then turns away. The profile cuts the light in half, as the face, now only half in this world, builds a half world on the other side, claimed Bonnard, any face is half a world away and waits. Mysterious, prolific, shadowy, dazzling, by a single candle. In that black or luminous square, Baudelaire crossed the room and closed the window. There is sand on fire, and we stray. Early windows had no glass. They were gaps until shuttered, at which point they went back to being walls. They'd paint, they'd paint faces on the shutters and open them by calling out their names. This changed the human body changed it to a gate, which is a breach. Jan de Betz recorded the sunlight coming in through the windows of a gallery for an entire day, how it crossed the floor in a broad, slow sweep, one frame an hour, a carnival of poise. What one can see out there in the daylight is always less. And Apollinaire, writing much later, saw a train in snow and flashing. The window opens like an orange, the lovely fruit of light. Saw the yellow dye in perfect squares and still the thriving snow, one eye closed as if lining up an object nearby with one in the distance, and the other eye closed as if momentarily suspended from a great height. Apollinaire's poem, Les Fenêtres, was published in the catalog for the 1913 Berlin exhibition of Robert Delaunay's window paintings, titled such things as Windows on the City, Simultaneous Windows, Windows Opened Simultaneously, whose studies in color suggested the splinter, whose affection for Bergson, who said the succession of our states of consciousness when the eye lets live in through the skin gently. Delaunay believed that the eye alone, half planet, half brain, could face the world entire, simultaneous, we, the unperished, we shatter into patterns, counting threads. Every window implies a blind spot. It's the air, the percentage of air in every scene, the portion that can't be seen lying over everything, the unveiled veil. Alberti also created a veil, one of threads to aid the student in establishing correct perspective, but explicitly stated that this was really a sort of window without glass. One of Bernard's last paintings is titled The Small Window and shows through an open window that frames three sides of the painting, another window, red, and at that distance a suggestion of a building or maybe by now a window alone, a thriving shore. 
The most beautiful things in museums are the windows, he said, looking out at the Seine from the Louvre, June 1946. And like Rachel's poem, some of those poems included quotations, so I hope you were all catching the quotations. They're all in italics in the text. I thought I would move to reading uh, a couple of short translations. This is a project I'm working on at the moment by a contemporary poet named Anne Perrion. And the book is a really fun project. It's short prose poems, very rhythmic, very sound-based, and composed almost entirely of adjectives, adverbs, and conjunctions. It's like almost no verbs and no nouns, so you feel like the poem is always kind of slipping away. And oddly enough, it makes, it makes the translation harder, but it also allows, it makes me feel like I can take more liberties because it is so sound-based and because it is so slippery. Uh, the book is called The Troisième, The Third, and it's about her son, and she was pregnant when she was writing the book, and so it's all about imagining this third, third term coming into her life. The only other character other than the son and the parents who don't show up uh, that shows up in the book is a white cat who appears in these sections. Anne Perrion from The Third. Some contrary effects. The model, the expert, not knowing of or what, it all is owed. This, which seems like that, turned to face once more, compromised before. Though he thought he knew how to hold his tongue, the held, made into arms, symbols, tools, dominates, captivates, and yet he hesitates, appropriates, dissipates, some intention he'd once had, principal actor on the scene, menacing, misknown, had thought to change, easy animal to take. What was he laughing about? What was he standing up for, against what he betrayed in return? And that's what carried off across the grass or found himself alone, who led, he said, a flock, a mute, wild to do the same, running down the slope, talking to himself if it had to be dangerously. Okay, so there are some verbs, there are some nouns, but... <laughs> Where could he see and assess? So up front he'd more than matched the rumor by tremor, pride, but hadn't he been forewarned, of which he, pride to be, taken for, is making of, he finds himself prepared, and nonetheless, why this? Made good on it, as if the deal was his, wished it, saw his own self taken there, running crossed is all, he wanted, though straw, leaf, or arrow that he desired, was good for nothing but getting here. Since he spoke, he wanted it for them, and there came back a trap. Undone for Cat, that white undone, should have owed him one for that. To turn around, like bait first seized, first supplely, unreleased. Like white, changed, livingly. And how a lot of the invented realized externally, lost from sight of it, for equal preference, lost when speaking of it. If he could have, would he? All that should now shows, and so was recognized in crossing, and so was as he said it. Where to lose or forget it? White cat who reigns, to teach a thing or two and to pursue, simple if not easy, wait and yet it pleases, which he makes increasingly discreet, continued, lazy, to pursue and to do it well, nothing not expected, hunted, identified by pattern. But also even more as by this set phrase, this attributed name, by gestures to appearance, signs hold him in place, repeated so that he, to satisfy that which he contravenes, is veering toward, against, and here again to think how to think, to deceive, not knowing, to obey.
and now I think I'll, I'll switch to two excerpts from two projects that I'm, one I just finished and one I'm working on at the moment. The next pieces are from a book called Ours, um, and it's subtitled, I suppose, The Gardens of André Lenotre. And André Lenotre was a uh, 17th century garden designer, and he was kind of the father of the French formal garden. He did Versailles, and he did the Tuileries, Vaux-le-Vicomte, Chantilly, all these huge estate gardens. And there's kind of a nice irony in his name in that the word Lenotre <clears throat> means in French, ours. If you were going to say, um, that red car is ours, it's ours, you'd say, ah, c'est le nôtre, that's, that's ours. And so all these gardens that he designed and built were all done for the aristocracy, most of them for royalty, so to say the least, private property. And yet, uh, today, they're almost all public parks. So just wait, and uh, it's all ours, right? Um, so... I'm just going to be reading sections from it. The first part um, <clears throat> talks about Lenotre and also a little bit about the history of gardens. And the one fact you need to know is that Lenotre was born in 1613. And I'm going to stop a lot for water. I'm, I'm sort of getting over a cough. A garden is a start. Because the kings of France love Tivoli, these windows bearing oranges globed, glowed. And that's how night becomes day without taking your eyes off their palaces in winter. A garden is a mirror, he said, stepping back to get a larger view. He knew a globe upon a table, that containable, while an orange will seem to expand in the dark. We've trained our explosions to slow down. We thought the world was warm, was orange, and hung ripe among the leaves all around us. From the French, garder, to keep as well as to tend. Gardien, guard bien, keep well, guard them within the horizon. Stepping back, dropping off, here he opens his arms, spreads out his hands. Now off the map, you will see. A garden is a window. A garden starts, of course, in the eye, which is looking out a window, which starts geometry on its rounds, each pane recording the faceted plantings that a single finger traces in the crisp veil of late frost, some fortunes turn dust to dust. André Lenotre spent his childhood among the gardens of the king and his gardeners, studying to be a painter. Who paints? This lives, who paces trees, who sees André Lenotre spent his childhood, everything he ever planted now is dead. André Lenotre died a rich man. Lenotre couldn't stand views that end, Saint-Simon. Half a century earlier, his grandfather had undertaken on his own and at his own expense to replace all the dead trees in the Jardin de Tuileries. We, who were born in 1613, are we who remain here in the garden as it leads a swan across an eye, is out of orbit, among the philosophers and larger. We left for the forest, through a grand avenue of oaks, all leaning inward, they leaned over as we spoke. Four rows of elm, all bordered in hawthorn, four huge coffers of shadow in flower, for four kilometers of one can only hope for a good handful of the restless coming down to earth. And to you we leave these trees. As if it were to curve, he said the earth, and it turned. As things turn to stone with a word spoken at a given angle to the wind. You measure the angle with an astrolabe and needle. The needle balanced on the middle finger and the eye aligned to the eye around which it glides. He dreamed of a spherical garden and listened to the spring tighten as he wound the clock, counting slowly as it slowly, unknowing, comes into view, reciting, but I'm an astronomer, I lose things. Other parts of the first section are more um, focused on the history of gardens, and so this one starts at the beginning with paradise. So 
Certain traditions claim that man and garden cannot be separated, or if and when they are, will neither still be visible, the inverse of those twins that you never see in the same place at the same time, we disappear in a single door, unrecognized. In the morning, in the park, where we sit behind the early paper and periodically declare, I can't believe. In the Middle Ages, they drew their news on cemetery walls, a long line of bodies in silhouette that swayed. This, too, they say, is paradise, because the sky touches the ground wherever the former has a hole in it called a hand, espaliered mansions and guests in the millions. The first public gardens in history were called oubliettes. As soon as you entered, you were indistinguishable from the animals. Um, I'm skipping the Middle Ages and going straight to the birth of landscape architecture. The birth of landscape architecture. The structure of many plants follows that of the golden section, width over length, length over width, minus the length of a spiral stair, of leaf by leaf, between gravity and sun, strung. All you have to do is enlarge it, make it the size of an average life, which makes it live twice. 17th century gardeners were trained in drawing, astronomy, cartography, and geometry, which included the science of alignment, all those intricate wheels, hand a boy a tiny engine. Here, Montaigne sent this from the gardens of the Villa d'Este, where in the 1570s he saw fountains that triggered organs and trumpets, and the birds fell silent in spirals, through which he freely returned with Italy, opening a small mechanical heart in everything green. the garden as architecture itself. Much early landscape vocabulary was an attempt to make the entire world your home. Le Nôtre, in particular, saw a hallway in his walking and so walked into a clearing called Festival Hall or the Water Theater or the Corridor of Mirrors, which multiplied the admission that only naming could bring this vast expanse circling in a chance ride in rings, kept in atoms, kept in jars on windowsills, who also had names, beginning with, my other house is larger. The garden as a word game. And so a whole language developed to say, green matters and water, no small part of any traveler, came to be its own ceiling, spoken, always building. Parquet pond and gate beyond, the Boulingrin, Peramont, and Vertagugan. And then another gate, flagrant and beyond, which, with the exception of statues which have no way of ending in a stairway of celebrated shadow, draft of flower, cousin of lawn, and will build you while crossing a falling trellis, and will build you an alphabet the leaves will orbit. The garden as extension. This first image is of a fountain at Versailles. The garden as extension. Bronze horses round the bend of water. La famille de la Nôtre, gardeners all the way back to the fall, crowned a fountain with intersecting shadows, the tip of the raised sword just grazing that of the palm tree in summer, which makes it summer. Who was born in a garden, we keep on coming forward. If you think of the trees as people, we were promised. And Mary reached out to the gardener, that from the poverty of touch, who took a step back, and someday all this, has been said by so many so often that the voice becomes a park. Does the verdant ever intersect the human? Does the heart, that green thing, stranded in an ocean? He noted, wind today, small gusts of rain. A partir de mes parterres, he laid out his gardens in terms of tribes that wandered as he turned and spoke to someone he can no longer see in the doorway, which is like a land bridge carved of air, 
Andre Le Nôtre was born in a difficult year. They spoke in numbers and planted the seed of doubt at the heart of a flickering fruit, in this case, a pear, sliced open to its white flower without creases in a seedless center where shadow becomes the point of the picture. Any garden is a description of its era's metaphysics. And the last one from this section is called Sir Mine. Um, Andre Lenotre became Sir Andre Lenotre. Sir Mine. Come 1675, come a home into a spine to say you are ennobled, sir, you are a condensation of huge portions of the population and responsible for their every whim. For instance, this blade of grass, the parallel is obvious. The king looked out on someone else's expanse. In 1675, Louis XIV made André Le Nôtre a noble, who took three snails and a cabbage for his coat of arms, who is walking in my garden, who is my garden, is also this fragrant, who upon waking would trace on the frosted window a perfect copy of a landscape by Corot, and would within it for just a minute disappear. And this next series is from a manuscript I'm currently working on, which is on ghosts. It's a really fun project. It's giving me license to sit around and read ghost stories all the time, which I find works great when I'm in an apartment or when I'm in a house and my husband's there. But when I'm all alone in a house, I was spending some time in a, in a old house in Iowa all by myself and thought, great, curled up with a ghost story and thought, no, I <laughs> closed the book and went back to reading detective novels where they just murder people. The murder don't come back. So this is a series of, of short, uh, short pieces based on that. The ghost. The ghost is itself a boundary, is that that distinguishes between the past and the after which is endless, and that a ghost itself cannot be older than the way a dead child is instantly than any of us will ever be, more widely a tendency toward repetition, which is itself a clock that stopped, that endless circling which traces a circle in dust on the floor. The sunlight sketches an hourglass was on again, the revenant, but no, time only seems circular to those on a spherical earth. Something about gravity that while a long line stretches out the errant of the heart, you know they cannot swerve, or perhaps the notion of a cyclical time comes only from the sun. If you lived anywhere else, you'd find you never see them again. <coughs> Varieties of ghost. Phantom. Specter, wraith, while the revenant, which exists only in French, is something distinctly different. It has distinctly come back. Thus it has been away. It was empty there, and it keeps the return. It turns in place and faces you, and it's not so empty now. It turns back and faces you, that remembered you, that forgot to say, that forgot something one day when you were in a hurry left something on the table and turned around and it was a letter or so many who came later would when crossing a street turn too quickly and there we were a stain on the air more by our love than by our longing from the 19th century on i'm i'm doing a lot with the history of ghosts too because it's one of those, whether or not ghosts are real, they're also um, a human construct, a social construct, and they have a distinct social history. From the 19th century on, our ghosts are strangers to us, have become estranged. In the Middle Ages, a ghost was much more likely to be someone the sighter had known and was not 
threatened and extended a hand to the specter who was clearly grasping for purchase on air and disappeared. I love her, and I wish I could have stayed. Whereas today, they frighten us because we've become unrecognizable. I was walking through and this is one from a series in the book that retells other people's ghost stories. And a lot of the book tells, retells ghost stories. And I'm, in this case, I chose never to use the other people's words exactly. Um, but it's interesting, this, the sort of professional ghost stories, those that get published, those that are written by ghost story writers like Le Fanu or um, et cetera, et cetera, have a, always have a distinct shape and they always have a moral. And in contrast, the sort of stories that people tell you when you ask them, have you ever seen a ghost, are really marked by the fact that they have no shape. There's no narrative curve ever. And, um, and there's never a moral. They're much more fun. I was walking through. I was walking through. My grandfather called. It was a long way from the window. He said, I ran like mad. It was his. I knew the house was alone. I knew the face that held. I had opened the door. I had expected. I had wanted. I heard. I knew his voice. I ran back up the hill. I slammed the door. And then I slammed the door. I am something heard and or a herd, as in do come with and the voices from the walls. When the heart breaks, it refuses to fall. The anatomy of a crowd, the one that walks within, the marrow of the crowd, which can't later be counted, which is the enumerate, which is who refuses. I'm noticing increasingly too that when I use I in this text, it's the voice of a ghost. <coughs> It's making me think this could be bad for one's health. This uh, poem takes its title from the last line of um, a poem by Dylan Thomas, with one word changed. After this death, there will be no other. Some say a child becomes the house. Some houses hold the child in hand. In the heart of a bird is its hollow home that green flight that lets the house lose form. Where was the room? Why a door to the air? Why air in the eye? And why only sky there? The child held the house in the palm of her hand, and the sky poured over it, painting her out. And the last one from this series is, um, is Back to the sort of moral idea, um, say all the professionally written ghost stories have morals. And the moral is usually, watch what you do. Because not only is it going to haunt you for the rest of your life, but you'll, you'll haunt other people. You'll end up um, being this, this haunting thing. It's called Old Wives' Tales. Whatever you do is forever done, and will mark the house, and the house the town, and the bird in the fire, that little tower, will come back on them who entered centuries later, who stain or find themselves that can't wash off, who simply walk in, don't open the jar, don't look in the mirror, the house that rides a flame to shore. You think you sell your soul, but it's not yours, it's air. It's the five cubic feet of air in which you stand that dies. And my brother, <clears throat> being a better mathematician than I, heard that, heard me read that and say, you know, if you had five cubic feet of air, you're talking about a 300 or 400 pound person. <laughs> and I'll have to change that line, but I haven't gotten around to it. Um, I'll finish with a couple of pieces. How many people here know H.H. H. Monroe, Saki's story, The Open Window? Boy, the canon has changed. I won't read that one. It's a great story. How many people know Saki, H.H. H. Monroe? Okay, well, he's a real treat. Next time you need to discover a new short story writer. He's really wonderful. 
Um, I think I'll read the section from the Book of a Hundred Hands that is the section on shadow puppets, um, which are, there, other, some people have different names for it, but a shadow puppet is, you know, when you arrange your hand and a light shines and it makes a, a puppet, makes a form, you all know what shadow puppets are. Okay, good. The first movies. Then all hands touched, hands shone. The hand was a public thing, a tool that rang when dropped. Two hands moved across. What moves between a screen and a match awakened in the cold. The smaller the light, the more enormous the hands will live. By a sound, will be gone. Enormous trees, a castle, a pond, and no sky in the broken ray into birds on the opposite wall. Birds. Most shadow puppets are birds. This all depends on darkness. Birds prefer darkness. Cockatoo, parrot, and lark have in common. You can see through them. A density based on ambient light. They must live inside any number of things. Things without number. Name them. Two flying birds. Two flying birds require both hands, as hands are more supple than the rest of the body because they don't belong to it. Birds. Behind frosted glass, grief shape, the finger tracing laterally across the back of the mirror, as you might, walking down a street, let your fingertip trail along the staves of passing gates, waist high, the birds dissolve, brief lakes in the window of, reflect thereon. Therefore the reflected sun, the wound in my hand, aches in weather, any weather, tattooed all the way up to the elbow, now it's winter. Geese cross in their soft V's, swift sign in the cirrus. The hand writes in the air, the bird stays there. <coughs> Birds, now you'll need thousands, Evenly, though rapidly dispersed, every finger unfettered, any bone can be feathered, this thousand driven hollow into the flock of all things numbered one through one hundred. Never was I so asunder, etc. So I open the window and let in the graves. Advances in the form. The latest work in shadow puppets is being done on verbs, Make the form of a sore, of a veer. Make the tense clear. Distinguish the past perfect from the simple past. Neither was, and on into conditionals. Would have found, etc. Would have gone, myself, but I wasn't home. Bird watchers often use sign language because, though birds are fond of the human voice, they're downright hypnotized by the swaying hands and will walk right into them. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderfully engrossing reading. It was great. Um, Cole has graciously agreed to answer a few questions from the audience. And this time I'll spare you the spectacle of having me try to memorize and repeat your questions. I'm going to walk around with this microphone and you can talk right into this. So, does anybody have a first question? Or a last question. Or a last question. Any question? I always ask uh, poets this question. When did you first realize that you were a poet? When I was 11, and I sort of remembered the moment. I was, I was sitting, I was writing a prose poem. I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. That's what it, my mother was a painter too, and I, I remember very distinctly thinking at that same time, I can't be a painter, because my mother's a painter, so I'll be a poet. I didn't think, I can't be a painter, because I can't draw or paint. <laughs> Which, so it's good that my mother wasn't a poet, or I'd be stuck being a painter and I can't paint, so. All, hello, hi. <laughs> um, all the poems you read tonight, 
all seem are all very thematically organized. I was wondering um, if you come to these themes like like first like I, I guess I'm just asking how you choose the themes. Like, do you write poems and then discover the themes in them, or do you choose the themes and then discover the poetry in those? I, I um, choose the themes first. Um, it's there always just seems to be something I really want to write on, and I'm I'm kind of afraid that soon there's going to be some. I'm just going to kind of not have an idea or not have something because it's not a matter of an idea. It's just something that I deeply want to write about. And so far that hasn't happened. I, I mean, I haven't, you know, run out of something. There always, there always seems to be a couple, I'm sort of like a couple books ahead. You know, there's two more that I know I'm going to work on after the ghost book. So, and I've really enjoyed trying to organize them, trying to come up with structures. And I, I realize that the structuring greatly helps the writing. I, I, I'll have this architecture in my head, and so I know exactly, I'll think, oh, well, now I need the poems that are going to make this bridge. Um, and I'm really interested in, in working kind of in a form beyond poetry, or, or that's, that sounds stupid, that's not right, um, in working with other, you know, bringing more prose into it. Uh, the ghost book is ha has a whole bunch of little mini interviews that are two two word two question interviews with people. Um, it's going to have these long prose sections too. So it's kind of scrambling the genre so much that it is no genre at all, but always based in sound and language, always um, based in rhythm and sound relationships, so that those rhythm and sound relationships are equally present in the prose, whether it's an interview question or a prose paragraph or lineated verse. Oh. Yeah, just following up on that question, I mean, one of the things that just so strikes me when I read you is this incredible balance you have between the, the narrative, the historical, the cultural, the detail, and this impeccable lyric voice that, that you know has the sound and rhythm as you just said and you know really it's not a question it's how do you do it no I mean what <laughs> how much do you know I mean there's an enormous amount of fact and research packed into your books do you do all the research before you start writing do you do them together do you take notes I mean could you say something about just anything about the process of yeah, yeah. I, I do the research as I'm writing, and it's, it's just great fun, because um, you can just wallow in these books. It's just really great. You sort of pick your favorite subject and give yourself license to sit around and do nothing but read about it. So it is, it is really great. Um, and I find that reading will often inspire me to write, and so sometimes I'll, I'll have, the, the Lenotra book was really a problem this way, that I would start to read, and the vocabulary, for instance, that's used to talk about gardens, you just want to drop and start writing. Uh, so it's kind of a, a trade-off, going, going back and forth. And, and I was thinking about the whole thing of theme can also be, I think, a way of, of saying something and even making sort of moral comments without having to do so. Um, and I think there was a certain point at which I got very interested about 10 years ago in going back to saying things. And I, I was working in the early 90s pretty much just with sound, particularly in a couple of projects that were um, almost working with sound to dissolve language. And as I said, then just got interested in going back and making comments about the world. Uh, but, but then how to avoid either didacticism or, um, you know, moral commentary. Or, you know, all these, there seems to be so many pitfalls uh, with a poetry that, that takes content forefront. Um, so somehow th this was a, a way for me to, or at least there's pitfalls for me. I mean, suddenly thought of all these people who write lots of great stuff that's content foreground, and um, 
don't fall into any of these pitfalls at all, but I do. So this was a way that I could get out of them too, as well as a way that I could also pursue some uh, subjects that I wanted to read about more deeply or investigate more deeply. Other questions? I don't, I don't have a fully formed question, but you did mention that the content was not foreground in your poems, and even the topics you choose are very immaterial. Yeah. Glass, ghost, and it's almost you're out, you're describing a peripheral experience, and I wanted to know: is that the easiest way for you to write, or what's what are you? That's a great observation, and I think it has something to do with wanting wanting to be working with something that is not yet coalesced. As if the writing is also a part of coalescing something or, or wanting the writing to always also be not quite set. And so with, by working with things that like white and all the things, are the windows, or um, they're all things that have a very kind of iffy presence. Um, and a very mutable presence. And I think it's, as I say, wanting to be working with something that will help the writing to uh, maybe retain some of that mutability, that ambiguity, that open-endedness. Yeah. Yeah. We probably have time for one more question. Hi, I was wondering if you would talk about um, the relationship between your translation projects and your own work, and um, you know how your translations maybe influence your own work, or if you try to keep it separate. Yeah, it's I, I'm never. I always think that oh, actually, oddly enough, the translation doesn't have that much um, influence on my work, um, but I know it must because you just don't spend that much time with literature rewriting it because of course with translation first you have to translate it but then you have to write it in English and so um, there's no way it couldn't have an influence and I noticed when I read the Anne Perion, Le Troisième, the third poems and then read the ghost poems just after at a reading about a month ago I realized that actually the rhythm I'm using at the moment is the rhythm that's in that book. And I did those translations probably a year ago to a year and a half even. So it wasn't consciously in my mind at all. And yet a year, a year and a half later, I find this rhythm coming out. And so I think that's definitely uh, that kind of influence. Also the idea of writing uh, book length pieces I think is something that um, you know, I, again, didn't realize it consciously. I just sort of started thinking in book-length terms. But it's something that I think I picked up from French, contemporary French literature in general, if not translation specifically. So, yeah. Thanks very much for listening, and thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>